All right, it's good to be back here this evening and had a good time out soul winning this afternoon. And again, I appreciate all the hospitality and uh, you guys have an awesome church here with a great uh, church family. So you got, you got a really good uh, uh, spirit of unity here, which is, which is really good. Keep up the good work. I'm sad I get to only spend a day here with y'all, but you know, hopefully they'll come back again in the future. Uh, the sermon I've got prepared for this evening is focusing in kind of on the last portion of John chapter 21 there. Of course, this is the resurrected Jesus. He's coming back and instructing. And so we find his disciples out fishing, right? Going back to their old secular jobs, right? And, and he, they'd just been with him and being taught and trained for those three and a half years during Jesus' ministry. And then, you know, after Jesus was gone, they kind of didn't really know exactly what to do. And they just end up going back to fishing. And I'm not going to get into all that, but, but we catch up here with uh, Jesus' conversation with Peter. And at the end of the chapter, this is pretty, there's a lot of things going on. I'm not going to spend too much time going into all the detail, but if you remember, Simon Peter denied Jesus Christ three times, right? When Jesus was arrested after the Garden of Gethsemane. Prior to that, Peter was like, you know what? I'll die before I deny you, essentially. He's saying, like, like, I will not deny you, though all men deny you. I'll never deny you. And of course, Jesus said, you know, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And, and we all know that story and, and we know exactly what happened. So now, after all of those events transpire, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, <coughs> excuse me, we're coming full circle here now where Jesus confronts Peter. And we're going to start reading here, rereading here in verse number 15. The Bible says, so when they had died, because of course they're out in the ship, right? So they can see that Jesus was there. He calls them in, tells them to drop the net. They get all these fishes and stuff and that doesn't break. And um, now all of a sudden, uh, Jesus is here. They ate some fish, and he's going to talk to Peter. It says, so when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. Now, I think the reason why Jesus is asking him three times, he's making a point, because three times did Peter deny the Lord Jesus Christ. So now he's kind of bringing it up and now he's being grieved. Like, man, why are you asking me? three times, you know, it's going to click in his mind, like, yeah, I, you know, I'd, I had denied him three times, but now he is here, but he's instructing him basically with the same thing. He's saying, you know what, do you love me? Do you really love, you know, do you love me more than these? Feed my sheep, feed my lambs. Peter is called to be, you know, an apostle, and one of the jobs of the apostles is to teach and to feed, and, you know, feeding the flock and feeding the sheep is a job that he was supposed to have now, and when you remember when Jesus first came on the scene, that he says, and we're going to actually look at this verse a little bit, that, that he's going to make you fishers of men, right? That they were fishermen by trade. James and John and Peter were all fishermen by trade. And he says, you know what? Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And from that moment forward, basically, they had a new job. They weren't supposed to be going back to that, to that old job anymore. Now Jesus, God, has given them a new job to do. And obviously, you know, it, it's, it's easier for us to look back on people in the Bible when they do wrong and when they, when they fail and stuff, and we can be real critical of them. Um, I try not to do that too much because I, I want to extend the grace just because just I know that I'm not perfect either. But it's still important to learn from them, right? I mean, the, the, their mistakes or failures are in there for a reason so that we can learn from other people's mistakes. We can learn when people do wrong so that we don't have to face the same thing. And one of the things that's really interesting about Peter, though, and Peter's a really interesting character in the scripture in general. Anyways, he's real um, driven and, and, and one of the top you know, disciples that we hear about him the most or close to the most uh, in the Gospels. And he, he has a, a lot of zeal, right? He's the one that stepped out of the boat when, when Jesus you know, called unto him. He's like, hey, Lord, if it's really you, bid me to come unto thee, unto the water, right? Jesus walked out of water. And he had the faith and the courage to just step out in faith from the boat and walk on that water, too. I mean, it's amazing. No one else did that, right? That was Peter. Peter has a lot of great qualities and things. Um, 
and a lot to learn from, but he also has his own flaws as well. But one of the things here that we're going to see, obviously just after this transpires, now Jesus is going to tell him what's going to happen at the end of his life. And look at verse number 18. It says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. He says, basically, you know, when you're young, you're able to do what you wanted. You gird yourself up and you go anywhere you want to go. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. So they're saying, you know, something's going to happen to you. They're going to stretch, stretch forth your arms and you're going to be brought to a place where you don't want to go. Right. And that and he said, and the Bible says here, verse 19, this spake he signifying by what death he should glorify God. So he's giving him this prophecy of what's going to happen to Peter in the future. And, you know, Peter hears this and it says, um, Excuse me, let's keep reading verse number 19. It says, This make he signifying by what day he shall glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Jesus saith unto him, If I, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. And the title of my sermon this morning is Follow Thou Me. Okay? And I know I kind of went into a lot of backstory there with Peter, but it, you know, it's all just laying the groundwork for what I want to get into. Jesus tells Peter, you know, here's basically the death that you're going to have to suffer for me. And he just tells him, follow me. And Peter sees John and he's going, okay, well, what's that guy going to do? And he starts worrying about what other, someone else's ministry is going to be. What's their life going to be like? Well, what are they going to do? And Jesus basically says, you know what? Don't worry about that. You've got enough to worry about just by you following me. Don't worry about what other people are going to do with their life and how they're going to serve me and everything else that they're going to end up doing. He says, just follow me. And what, he, what Jesus ends up saying then is that, you know, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? So basically saying, if I want him just to be around until I come back, until I return, how does that affect you at all? That's none of your business. It doesn't matter. I'm going to choose different people to glorify me in different ways. You know, there's different disciples. There's different followers of Jesus Christ that some of them end up becoming martyrs. Right? But not all of them. We see, you know, Stephen was a martyr. Right? Way back in the book, in, in Acts chapter 7, we see that happening. But you know what? Not every single disciple is going to go down that route. And we have a path to walk. We have a ministry. We have a purpose. We have a life to live of dedication and, and service unto the Lord. And different people are going to be on different paths as the Lord will. And we don't need to get caught up and start worried about what other people are doing because we have our own walk. We've got our own job. We've got our own priority. We've got, we got our own you know, life to live and our own concerns and our own cares when it comes to serving the Lord we don't need to get wrapped up in anyone else's business when it comes to their service to the Lord. And this is what Jesus is trying to teach. And, you know, and then, of course, the disciples hear that and they're going like, oh, man, now John's not going to die and stuff. He's like, that's not what he said. Right. He said, if I will, if I want that to be the case, right. so be it. What is that to you? He didn't say, well, he's not going to die because, of course, we know that he did. Yeah. We know that he passed on because Jesus hasn't returned yet. But they didn't they didn't know. Now. Peter was a great apostle. And I said, you know, he had many victories. He had a lot of boldness and faith. But even Peter failed and ended up denying Christ. So I guess my point is here that he has no room to be worried about what other people have to do and how they're going to serve Jesus with their life. Right? He, he has no place to, to even consider. He's like, you know what? It's, it's, it's hard enough for you, Peter. You said you, said you were going to not deny me, and you did three times. Right? I told you I want you feeding the flock. Now I've got to remind you again three times. Don't worry what other people are going to be doing. And I think this message, too, there's, there's something special, hopefully, here for everybody here. I mean, this, this is applicable to every believer. But even in a church like here, you're a satellite church, right? There's a lot of different people that you could, you're going to be hearing from. You get different guest preachers coming in and, and preaching and maybe even, um, you know, looking at what Steadfast is doing in Fort Worth and kind of comparing you know, what they do with what you do. 
And at the end of the day, you don't need to worry about all of that stuff. Just worry about focusing on serving the Lord yourself. Amen. Right? There's following Jesus, following the Lord, doing what he has for you. You know what he has. You, you know the work he's got set out for you. It's not that difficult. Right? The, the, the good thing is about, about the Christian life is that it's not, I shouldn't say it's not difficult, it's not complicated. There's a difference, right? The difference between being difficult and complicated. God's law, God's commands, what God would have us to do is not complicated. It's very simple. It's very straightforward. The, the Christian life, you know, coming to church, being a minister, serving others, right? Getting in the Word, spending time with God in prayer, in reading, in, uh, in, in soul winning, and, you know, doing these things, you hear them preached over and over again, you read them in the scripture, it's not complicated, right? Keeping yourself from, from walking in the flesh and all this, the sinful lusts of this world, not complicated. Not always easy, but it's not complicated. Very simple path. It's not, it's not so hard to understand the simple do's and don'ts and what we should be doing with our life. We don't need to complicate it by getting involved in what other people are doing. Now, I, do, I will say this, and I do think it's good to be encouraged by what other people are doing. Yeah. Right? And it is good to see how other people are serving the Lord as edification, as encouragement. Like, oh man, way to go. You guys are doing this great job. Awesome. You know, and, and, and use that to help uh, spur you on and keep you going and keep you excited and zealous in the work. But don't ever let yourself get to the place where you're just kind of looking at other people and being more concerned and focused about what they're doing. You've got a job to do here. You've got a job to do yourself. And, you know, like Jesus was telling on the Peter, you know what? Follow me. John's, John's got his own walk. John's got his own deal to deal with. Don't worry about John. Worry about you. Worry about Peter. Follow me. Follow thou me. Turn if you go to Romans chapter 12. <clears throat> Romans chapter 12. We start reading verse number 3. The Bible reads, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. And the, the concept of humility, right? The, the walking in humbleness of mind and humility and lowliness, lowliness and meekness is obviously a Christian attribute that is, that is mentioned over and over and over and over again in scripture and it's going to be one that's going to help you especially when it comes to being able to stay focused on following the lord right and, and and being concerned about your work when you're not so lifted up in pride and have this 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 high attitude of being able to tell everyone else what they need to be doing or worried about what everyone else is doing you know what i just need to worry about the job that i have to do Let's keep reading. Verse number four it says, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. And obviously the church is comprised of many members, and that there's different offices and different positions and different things that, excuse me, need to be handled and managed within the church, within every church. But it is a body that's made up of individual members. And God has different people in different places because he's given different people different abilities to serve him with. God's given gifts to all of us and strengths and, and things that we can do and, and you know, different blessings, whether it be you know, in our mind and our talents and our abilities. Not everybody has all the musical talents. Not everybody is able to do um, um, even some of the preaching. Not everyone is able to do various tasks within a church. Not everyone's going to hold the same office. But it's important for a church that all of these things are being met, that all, that all of the offices are being filled, that all the, the work is going to be done because if you have a body that's lacking in any one part, you're not going to be at full force to get the most work done. 
I mean, if you just think about a physical body, right, if you're lacking in any area, if, you're, if your eyesight's just really bad, if your hearing is bad, if your smelling's bad, if you're missing an arm or a leg, it's going to hamper the amount of work that you can get done from just being at full health, fully functioning, everything working properly, you know, as, as a you know, well-oiled machine, as it were, you can get a lot more things done and accomplished. And if we all have the same mind and if we all have that same goal and you have the unity of spirit here and everyone's willing to work and you're going to put in focused on, well, what does God, what has God given me and what can I do to serve? Then you're going to end up having a full body that's, that's working and doing, you know, being able to work to capacity and, and not lacking an area because you're focused on what can I do for the church. And the wrong attitude to have is, well, what can the church do for me? Right? And that's, unfortunately, that's an attitude a lot of people have. Right? You talk to people and you say, hey, we're inviting people to church. Everything. Well, what do you got for the kids? What do you got for this? What do you got for me? Well, you know, it's like, and I get it. You know, it, babes in Christ, you can have that attitude. You know, unbelievers, you know, but we want to be able to teach and to train and disciple and get people to understand that, you know, the Christian life, you shouldn't be living your life thinking, what's in it for me? And what can you do for me? The whole purpose of the church and ministry is that you're ministering others. I mean, if Jesus Christ himself was able to come to this earth and serve other people, who in the world do you think you are to expect other people to be serving you when you go into the house of God? How about you start serving people, right? And that's, that's what we need to do. Now, look, when, people, when visitors come in, you're going to serve them, Right? You're going to make them feel welcome and at home, and you're going to do what you can for them. Why? Because you love them and you care for them. You're going to esteem others better than yourself. And that's a humble lowliness of mind, but it's not going to be focused on um, just what can you do for me. Right? And when you have that mindset of being focused on other people, not on what they're going to do and what their job is, how can I help that person succeed? Right? That's the, the, the humility of mind that we need to have. Not, whoa, well, what's John going to do? How about you, you know, you worry about following Jesus and then maybe what you can do to help John yeah. Yeah. instead of worry about how is he going to end up? What can I do to make him more successful? Good. Verse 5 again, so we being many are one body in Christ and everyone members one of another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. All these different things that, that you, know, you may or may not be good at or better at than other people. Some people are really good at teaching, really good at breaking things down, really good at making examples and stuff. Hey, great, use that for the Lord. Use that to help. How can you use that to help within the church? How can you teach? What can you do? Right? Maybe some people are really good at just organizational skills, maps, soul winning, things like that. Hey, let's get things really organized. We can, we can do a lot more if we have this system and we're putting this in place. Great. You know, not everyone has that same skill and ability and level of, of you know, being able to do those things. Some people are a lot more haphazard, right, and not nearly as structured. Well, you know what? You have skills in other areas then that's going to be able to provide a benefit to the church. Right? So God's given all of us different skills, and we can't be looking on other people. As the um, you know, Bible says, I think it's in 1 Corinthians, where it's talking about the different members of the church, very similar to Romans chapter 12. Yeah. You're saying, well, because I'm not the eye, I'm not of the body. Yeah. Right? And, and people are just worried about the, the, the positions and jobs that kind of get the most attention. Like, oh, well, if I'm not the pastor, then what can I possibly do? It's like, there's a lot of things you could do. Right. Just ask anyone here, right? Because there's not a pastor sitting down in the pews. But does that mean nothing's getting done then? Is there no work? Right. Nothing happens, right? Because when the pastor's not here, there's, there's nothing to be done. No, that's not how a church works. Yeah. Everyone needs to be pitching in. There's a lot of work to be done, right? Local churches have all kinds of things going on. The pastor has one job, right? That's one position. That's one office. But there's plenty of other work to be done that's going to help and support the church as a whole. Amen. Yeah. And we shouldn't just be worried and focus on, oh man, what's that person do? Look, follow thou me. 
There's plenty to do to stay focused on the work that you have to do when you choose to follow Christ. This is what I, was, uh, I mentioned earlier in Matthew 4.19 where Jesus said, and he saith unto them, Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So if we're going to focus on following Jesus, like he said to Peter, follow thou me. Well, you know, we just got done looking at Romans 12. We're talking about different gifts and different skills and abilities. This is one of the things that if you follow Jesus, you can't say, oh, well, I don't have that ability. I don't have that skill. Because if you follow Jesus, he says he will make you fishers of men. And that wasn't just for Peter and James and John. That's for anyone who's going to follow Jesus. Because that is the ultimate goal, is to lead people unto Christ. And anybody can do that. And if you're willing to follow Jesus, instead of being worried about what everyone else is doing, if you decide, you know what, I'm going to follow Jesus. Follow thou me, he'll make you a fisher of men. Even if you're not that good and not that comfortable and you're kind of shy and you have other things, you know what the great thing about God is? is that God is willing to distribute unto anybody who's willing to offer themselves up and yield themselves unto the Lord. In areas where you're lacking, he can give you enough to get you to where he needs you to be. If it's a service to the Lord, he'll make sure. If you've got the willing heart and attitude, he'll, he'll bring you there. And you know what? God actually likes doing that because it's going to bring more honor and glory unto him anyways. Right. And so I love, I love being able to, to explain to people and tell people my own personal background because I don't think I'm just like the most fluent and best orator or anything like that by any stretch of the imagination. But anyone who knew me before com you know, compared to now, it, it's, a, it's a huge drastic difference. I was the type of person that used to physically get ill if I it, just at the thought of standing behind like a pulpit or a podium or being the center of attention and having people listen to me like public speaking terrified me terrified me I mean literal pains in my guts that would keep me just just buckled over in pain for a long amount of time and, and I and I say this because if God is able to, to work in my life and to be able to bring me to the point to where I can stand before people now and be able to do this, he can do that for anybody. Okay, going out and going soul winning, I had to force myself to go soul winning just because I knew that the Bible taught that I knew it was the right thing to do. I was terrified. And you know what? That fear is stupid. It's, it's foolish. I mean, what do you really have to be afraid of? Nothing, right? People sitting here, y'all go out to... Was there anything really terrifying today when we knocked on people's doors? No. There's a lot of friendly people that we talked to. I don't know. I mean, we didn't even have anyone curse us out or anything. It was no problems, right? We're just talking to people. But you know what? For some people, the thought of that is terrifying. And I was one of those people. I was the person who would knock on the door and hope they didn't answer. Because <laughs> I didn't want to deal with it. But that's what over years and years of, of, it didn't even take years to get to a point, you know, Different people is going to take a different amount of time, but God can work in your life, okay? The willingness, all I was saying is, you know what, God, I know you want me to do this, so here I am. I'm going to, I'm going to do this, okay? Just because I know that, that it's something that you're commanding to do. And he was able to work in my life to get me to the point to be able to not buckle over in pain, to not even have to be nervous anymore and actually start to enjoy and to like I love preaching now. I love going to soul winning. I love talking to people. But I haven't always been that way. And I could only attribute that to the Lord. It wasn't my own power of overcoming things and my own anything. God had to help me with that. And, and that's just one area. Do you want to serve the Lord? What can you do for him? Ask yourself that. What does God want you to do? What has God already gifted you with that you could, you could expand on and do more for him? That's what we need to be focused on. You could get other ideas from other people. That's great. But don't get too wrapped up in what other people are doing. You serve the Lord. You get so wrapped up in what other people are doing, you can forget that you have a walk with God. <laughs> let's, let's start doing things. Here. This group. You, me, all of us just, just doing the work that God has for us.
Let what others doing, are doing be an encouragement, not a hindrance. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. Jesus told Peter, follow thou me. We know if we follow Jesus, he's going to make us a fisher of men. Jesus also said to his disciples in Matthew 16, 24, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So there is a cost. If anyone's going to follow him, we have to deny ourselves. Denying yourself means you're being a servant. Or you're serving others. You deny yourself to serve others. Say, I'm going to put other people before me. Just as Jesus denied himself, he denied himself of rest. He denied himself of sleep. He denied himself of oftentimes food and water and, and various things, physical things in this world to serve other people. I mean, how many times you read about Jesus going in a mountain to pray and he's praying all night and do, you know, he, he's not praying for himself. I don't believe that. I think he's praying. Like, I mean, obviously there's times where he's praying for, for, you know, to the Father for things that he needs, but he's also be praying for other people. He's praying for his disciples. He's praying for the people he's ministering to. He's, he's going forth and healing. He's not healing for himself. He's healing because other people have need. He's going out and doing all this work that's completely selfless. And if you're going to follow Jesus, well, that's the path that he was on. We need to learn to deny ourselves take up our cross, our burden, and follow him. And you know what? That's a lot of work for anybody to do, to be too worried with what other people are doing. Yeah. Let's deny ourselves and follow him. Luke chapter 9, look at verse number 46. The Bible reads, Then there arose a reasoning among them, which of them should be greatest? Now, there's nothing wrong with this thought when you're serving the Lord of, hey, I want to succeed. I want to be really great in my service to the Lord. I don't think there's a problem with them having this. Now, they didn't really understand how to be the greatest at serving. Jesus is going to teach them how to be the greatest. But it's not like a bad goal or a bad aspiration or anything like, like carnal about just, hey, I want to, I mean, yeah, I want, I want to serve. I want to get a lot of rewards and I want to do great things for the Lord and I want to be greatest in God's eyes. Amen. That's good. But he explains how to do that. So you want to be a great uh, worker, laborer for the Lord, and you want to follow Jesus. He explains that here. How could you be the greatest? Verse number 47, Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart, took a child and set him by him, and said unto them, Whosoever shall receive this child in my name receiveth me, and whosoever shall receive me receiveth him that sent me. For he that is least among you all, the same shall be great. So he that is least among you all means the person who doesn't think of themselves that highly. The person who is the least, you know, esteems themselves the least and is esteeming other people the most and is able to, to have the humility that a child has, right? As we said, a child in the midst. Children have to be very humble when you think about it. They're relying on older people to supply them with food, with shelter, with clothing, with everything that they need to survive, they are relying on someone else for that. That's why Jesus Christ you know, also uh, references children when it comes to having a faith, right? You need to have faith, like childlike faith. Why? Because we're just completely trusting Christ as our Savior, just Him alone. Like, that's what we're trusting. We can't do it on our own. We can't, you know, work our way into heaven just as much as my one-year-old can't go out and work to provide for her own food and clothing and everything else, right? But just completely, just, just insane to think that she would ever be able to do anything like that. Well, it's the same way with us, with our salvation. There's, there's absolutely no way we could do it. We have to completely just rely on Jesus. Well, when it comes to serving the Lord too, though, we have to have that same level of faith where we're just trusting Jesus and that humility of, uh, of being able to put others before us. Now, this is a real interesting passage because this passage is found in other Gospels and, and, he, and he kind of brings this up. But in Luke chapter 9, look at verse number 49. This is followed up with them asking, you know, reasoning who's going to be the greatest. Verse 49 says, And John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him because he followeth not with us. And Jesus said unto him, Forbid him not, 
For he that is not against us is for us. Now, you know, when it comes to us following the Lord, we don't need to, con- you know, other people are going to be serving God and could be doing a great work for God and might not follow exactly the way that, that you follow the Lord and the way that you serve Him and the work that you're doing. But it doesn't mean that they just need to be forbidden from serving God. Now, I'll say this too. This is really important. There's a difference between the false prophet who's leading people astray, right, and damning people to hell that needs to be marked and avoided and called out and everything else. That, that, is, that serves a purpose. This is not that case. They're just finding someone else who's actually serving God by casting out devils. And, he, and it, it's not in Luke here, but he says in, uh, I forget which gospel it is, that you know, no man that's doing miracles can, can lightly say evil against me. Or so, something to that effect. I, I, forget, I don't have it exactly memorized. But he's saying that, you know, hey, he's doing good. He's not, he's not just, uh, you know, causing damage. He said, basically, they're not against us, they're for us, right? And there could be plenty of people out there, for example, you know, in old IFB churches that are out soul winning and doing good work. We're not trying to forbid anything like that from going on. Hey, praise the Lord. We got more workers out there serving God and doing good and, and amen. Would to God there were more people out there doing good. And that should just be encouragement and everything else. And you know what? You guys, you know, you've got your ministry and you're following the Lord as you you. Great. Keep doing that. I've got a job to do and I'm going to keep focusing on what I need to do here. Right? Again, not just meddling in everyone else's business, but following the Lord as he has called us to do. And even if someone's not, you know, like, well, you should be doing this. Look, that's not your job necessarily to be telling everyone else how they should be following the Lord, right? Everyone's in a different position, different role. Other people out there serving the Lord, what we're doing, amen, just let them do it, right? If they're not against us, they're for us. Verse number 50, and Jesus said unto him, forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us, verse 51, and it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did? And, you know, this is just, again, highlighting the wrong spirit that you're supposed to have. You know, basically what's happening is that Jesus is going to go to Jerusalem and all they were doing is just looking for a place to, to go among the Samaritans where they could just stay the night or whatever and just kind of find a place to stay as they're headed to Jerusalem. But they didn't receive him. Now, of course, they should have received him, but they didn't, right? But this isn't like some capital offense to not just graciously welcome them in to where now they need to command fire to come down and destroy these people because you're not welcome to sin. Now, it's interesting because what Elijah did, okay, he was minding his own business, and these guys are coming trying to take him. Oh, man, you got to go see the king and everything. It was more of a threat on his life when that fire was commanded down from heaven. We said, you know, if I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven. You know, totally different situation. So, in this situation, Jesus has to rebuke them. Verse 55, it says, But he turned and rebuked them and said, You know now what manner of spirit you are of. Now, it's not to say there's never a time and place for fire to come down from heaven and destroy some people. But this isn't the reason. <laughs> it's, not, it's not when just people don't receive you. It's like when you go out soul winning, hey, no, people aren't receiving this at all, and they might curse you. Out, but it's like, you know what? We don't need to call for God to just destroy them with fire out of heaven. Let's just shake off the dust of our feet and move on, right? We got a lot of other things to deal with. That's not the spirit that we're supposed to have towards these people, especially these people that just aren't going to receive you. Just move on. Verse number 56, For the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. So they said, you know what? They're not receiving us here. We'll move on. Right? Let's not worry about just damning them and sending destruction on them because they didn't receive us. Maybe they'll receive us again another time. 
Verse number 57, And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And, uh, you know, just a brief note, whenever you see the word I will in the Bible, it's not talking about like, because um, we use that word, I will go to the store later or something, meaning like I am going to go, right? It's kind of the way that we think about that word. The I will is more of like a I want. It's a, if you got to think of a will as like a last will and testimony. It's like someone's wishes. It's what they want to do. So we keep that in mind. So when this person saying, I will follow thee, whether several thou goest, he's saying like, like, it's my desire and I want to follow you anywhere you go. That this is my intention. It's my plan. It's what I want to do. And Jesus has to, to tell him here, verse 58, and Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. So you're saying, okay, again, here, this goes into that cost of following Jesus, right? Jesus told Peter, follow thou me. And this is something that we could look to, follow thou me. But if you really want to follow Jesus, you know what? When Jesus was, was serving and doing his ministry, he didn't have a place to lay his head because there's a lot of work to be done. He had to travel all over the place. You might find yourself not quite as comfortable as you'd like to be. And the reason why a lot of people don't follow Jesus is because it, it does get uncomfortable. Because you do have to sacrifice. You do have to stay up late. You do have to, to be in places that are not comfortable to stay. You know, he didn't have a place to lay his head. He didn't know exactly where he was going to stay that evening. And he says, this is what you can expect if you want to follow me. Verse 59, and he said unto another, follow me. So this is, you know, that person was asked to say, hey, I'll follow you wherever he goes. He tells them, and now Jesus t turns to another person. He says, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury their dead. But go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. As we start to see, turn if you would to um, 1 Peter chapter 2. When it comes to following the Lord, when it comes to following Jesus, there's a lot to concern ourselves with that should leave us not much time on what other people are doing. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 21. The Bible reads, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. And now it's going to go through some of these things that Jesus Christ did that are an example for us who did no sin. Now, yeah, obviously we can't perfectly keep that, but you know what? If you're going to follow Jesus, that's the goal. That's the mark. That's the example he set for us, right? Keeping yourself unspotted from the world. That's pure religion and undefiled, is keeping yourself unspotted from the world and to go and visit the, the fatherless and widows in their affliction. Jesus, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. He wasn't deceitful. He wasn't trying to trick people. He was honest. Right. He was open. And... Um, it says, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. Remember that. When he was reviled, he reviled not again. People were speaking evil things about him. He didn't have to go and then speak evil to them back. He didn't have to do a tit for tat every time that someone is going to revile him. This is the example that Jesus left for us. When he suffered, he threatened not but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. So when people would wrong Jesus, here's the example he left. You know what? I'm going to let God judge on that. And that's the way that we ought to be too. When people wrong us and slight us and try to slander us, God sees all and he knows and we can let him right the wrong. Let him judge it because he will judge it. If we decide to take things in our own hands, guess what? He's not going to judge it then. And I don't know about you, but I'd much rather trust in the righteous judgment of the Lord than me getting it wrong. Because then if I go and I, and I try to bring forth even more bad judgment that's not appropriate for the situation because I'm just offended and I think that this person deserves this much more, then it's going to come back on me. With what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. Yeah. I'd much rather leave the judgment unto him that judgeth righteously. And hey, he can take care of it. And I'm not going to let that be a distraction unto me 
but I'm going to keep moving forward. Verse 24, who his own self bear our sins and his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you are healed. Of course, um, we can't do that. That's something that only Jesus can do. Lots of verses talking about following Jesus, but now I want to transition a little bit. This is kind of a two parts of the sermon. One is about following Jesus and then not being distracted with other people. But follow thou me is the title of my sermon. And I want to bring up the appropriateness of not just following Jesus. Obviously, Jesus is, you know, at the forefront always and has the preeminence. But there's nothing wrong with being a follower of a man as they follow Jesus also. There's nothing wrong. In fact, not only is there nothing wrong with it, it's actually encouraged and taught in Scripture too. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And please turn with, the, with me to these passages because they're important as well. And too many times people get this notion oh, I don't like man-made religion, all this stuff. And what they really are saying is they don't like being told anything from anyone of what's wrong, what's sin. They don't like hearing that. And they want to avoid that. And, and they think, oh, well, I don't need church anyways, right? Because where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. And they think that that's church. And they think that when they open up the Bible with their family at home, that that's church. And they could hang out with their friends. They could talk about Jesus, and that's church. You know what? That's not church. Yeah. Amen. That's not church. Right. Right. And I'm going to read for you from Ephesians chapter 4. This is a place that I, I, I like leaving people with. You know, because oftentimes we want to soul winning and talk to people and inviting them to church. Hey, we'd like to have you come to our church. And whenever I get someone who tries to say why... I don't really want to go to church anyway. Like I don't go to church anywhere because I don't think that there's any, you know, whatever the reason that they're giving in where they just, just feel like they're not going to go to church at all. Cause a lot of people are open to the idea of coming to church. It's not a problem for them, right? They just don't do it. But the ones that, that really make it a point to say that, you know, that to kind of bash on the institution of the church, that the fact that there even is a church and you're, you know, we're having this, there is so much scriptural evidence contrary to that, right? That's just showing that the church is really important. I always bring people to Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4, I'll just read this for you. You're turning to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The Bible reads in verse number 11, Ephesians 4, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. There are lots of people out there trying to deceive people with religion. And the reason why church is important is because God has given some apostles and prophets and teachers to help believers, to help you as a ministry to help other people. God has ordained that there could be pastors and churches that he's given with his requirements and, and his standards to teach the word of God to help you. And why would so much scripture be dedicated to this? Why would God dedicate a chapter in 1 Timothy chapter 3 or in Titus chapter 1 and talk about the qualifications of a bishop and that this is an office within the church and that he's giving this to you for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry? Look, this happens in church. This doesn't happen at your home. Who's the bishop in your, in your meetup group for talking about the Bible? Who's meeting the qualifications? Who's been ordained? This is the way that God designed things to run. It's absolutely important. But as we're talking about this, we need to also recognize, you know, as there's different offices, right? God has given some apostles and prophets and teachers. And there's people who are set up with an authority given by God 
you know, not just taken on themselves and not just usurped, but given by God for the purpose of the perfection and the unity of the faith and to help warn and guide against those that are lying in wait to deceive. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we're going to see the Apostle Paul, you know, we already saw this morning how he was saying to, um, that, that you have many instructors, right? You have thousands of instructors in Christ, but not many fathers. And he was, he was trying to emphasize like, hey, you know that my doctrine is good because I led you to Christ, yeah. right? So follow me. In 1 Corinthians 11, he says in verse number one, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now, obviously, following Christ, you could go just, there's no wrong ever in following Christ because he's always right, he's perfect, we get that from the Word of God. A man can fail, right? A man can be wrong, a man can have error, a man can, can not always be correct all of the time. That's the downfall of a man, but that's where he says, be your followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. You can still follow a man to the extent that they're following Christ every single time. And obviously you need to be aware that no one's going to be perfect and you shouldn't lift up a man higher than they ought to be while at the same time recognizing that God has given positions and offices for men to help instruct and teach and guide and rule in the house of God. All of those things are given by God to do for our edification, for us to learn and to grow thereby so that we don't just have a bunch of spiritual babies, that, that there is somebody helping to teach and to guide. Verse number two, now I praise you, brethren, that you, now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is a man, the head of Christ is God. And, you know, he's basically just, just giving the order there, the structure, the authority structure. Um, turn if you go to Philippians chapter 3. But that's just, that was, that's one place where we see one among many. We're going to see a few more here where he says, be ye followers of me even as I also am of Christ. So he's saying, follow me. There's nothing wrong with the Apostle Paul saying, follow me. I'm giving you good instruction. Follow my ways. I'm doing things to help you. Follow my example. Follow me. Even as I also follow Christ. Philippians chapter 3, verse number 13. The Bible reads, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Look what he says in verse 17. Brethren, be followers together of me. And mark them which walk, so ye have us for an ensample. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. One of the reasons why it's important to be a follower of someone like the Apostle Paul, as he's following Christ, is then you can see a difference, because he's like, you know what, there's some people that need to be marked, he says, walk so you have us for an example. Because there's many false prophets out there. There's many people who are going to be deceitful. He said that they're the enemies of the cross of Christ. So I'm giving you a good example. Follow me. Follow my example. Follow my lead. And don't get swept away with these other false prophets out there that are, that are there to deceive. Don't get swept up with the, with the Joel Osteens of the world that are out there with their shining face and telling you everything's so great. And, oh, they've got their trendy way of doing things. You know what? No, follow the guy who you can trust that you know their ministry is sure. Amen. You've seen their fruit. They know what they're doing. They're doing a good work. Follow that example. Follow the example of the Apostle Paul. And don't worry about these other guys that are out there, you know, that are very deceptive and are very deceitful that can, that can get you to follow their ways, that they're, they're enemies of the cross of Christ. Turn, if you would, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 
Verse number 5, the Bible reads, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. Now, I'm going to pause right here. And I, like, I, you know, I, I like sharing personal testimonies. One, because I think people are always interested in hearing stories anyways, right? I always like hearing that when I'm sitting and listening to preaching. And it's easy to connect to and it's easy to relate with. But also, you know, in my own stories, like I know what's true. I know what I've experienced and I know what I dealt with. And I know how things can relate to the scripture here. And what I'm seeing here in verse number five, our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power. We were talking, you know, between services, I was talking with some of the people here, just a little bit about my past and my personal experience. And, and when I first started going to Faith Forward Baptist Church with Pastor Anderson, and, and kind of how all of that came about and, you know, for my salvation and to getting plugged into church and everything like that. And one of the things that really stuck out with me with going to that church, because I'd been to various churches. I was telling some people here, you know, I, I kind of got, went to this church, that church for a while, just tried different churches, and nothing ever really stuck. Nothing ever was just standing out as like, oh man, I need to come back here ever. They all just seemed the same. Every church I went to was just, really dry, not much learning, not much anything going on. And I was a babe in Christ. Now, granted, I lacked the character that I should have had to do what was right and not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some was. You know what? The manner of that person was me. I shouldn't have been forsaking the assembly. Okay? So bad on me for not doing that. But I'll tell you what, there was a very significant difference. Between, the, between Faithful Word Baptist Church and every other church that I had been to up to that point. And the difference was that the gospel was being preached. It didn't come in word only. It wasn't just someone giving lip service to the gospel. It wasn't just saying, oh yeah, the gospel is great and praise the Lord and everything else. It was someone doing something about it. It was something being done in power. It wasn't just someone preaching about sin and sin is bad and sin is wrong. It was someone living it. It was someone that I can see the fruit of the ministry that I can go with and see, hey, here's someone who actually believes the Bible. Here's someone who's living the Bible. Here's someone who's not just saying, oh man, this is a sin, don't do this. And they're going off being a hypocrite and doing the same exact thing. It's someone who's taking the word seriously and doing, you know what, that has power. And someone who could thunder with authority from the scripture saying, thus saith the Lord. Because they've got the Spirit of God upon them, because they're walking in the Spirit, because they're doing the work of God. The power didn't come from the flesh of Pastor Stephen Anderson. It came from him walking in the Spirit, and that was evident. That was evident in his ministry. That was evident when I went there. I can see the zeal for the Lord. And you know what? That's what got me plugged in. And you know what? That got me following that example. And that's what helped me to follow the Lord. Because I was able to follow a man as he followed Christ. Yeah. Yeah. And something that I can see and, 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 and you know, uh, take in and see this is how you do it. You could, it's one thing to kind of read on a page. It's another thing to see it in action. Yeah. There's so much benefit to being able to follow a man to that extent. Now, obviously, you have to have your limits. Yeah. We're not cultish. I'm not cultish. This isn't just a, oh, Pastor Anderson's my God, and he's, you know, like, look, if he's wrong about something, okay, that's where I stop. And you know what? I think he is wrong on some things. Now, I'm not going to stand up here and just try to bash areas or, or, or bring up points of contention where I say, oh, I disagree with him, because it doesn't matter. I'm going to teach what I believe, and I'm going to follow Christ as I see best. I'm going to preach the way that I see things. And I'm not worried about every little thing that he does and try to inspect with a microscope everything that he says. And I don't do that with him. I don't do that with Pastor Shelley. I don't do that with any other friends that I have. I don't do that with anybody, let alone friends. I don't just sit in there and try to dissect every little thing that they say and do and who they talk to. And you look, it's too much. Yeah. Right. What is that to thee? Follow thou me. Amen. Yeah. But I'll tell you what. The, the, the being a follower of someone who's following Christ is a good thing. And there's no shame in that and there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's something that can help you and it's something that is good for you. 
And thank God that you do have someone to follow here because you have a pastor. Yeah. Yeah, amen. Pastor Shelley is doing great things. Yeah. Amen. And unfortunately, he, was, he, was, he got himself in a situation, not got himself, but he took on to serve in, an, in a great need where there's a great need that needed to be done and was willing to be selfless and come in and take on a lot of baggage that he had nothing to do with. Okay, instead of people bashing on different areas, oh man, he didn't deal with this, right? He didn't deal with that. Look, you know what he did? He put his own life and ministry and everything else that he was planning on doing on hold and took on a great responsibility for you and for everyone else. Praise God for that. And you don't need anybody nitpicking and bashing and everything else. Yeah. Is Pastor Shelley perfect? No. Am I perfect? No. But I'm not going to sit here and, just, and just, just try to point out every little flaw of anybody. Right. Yeah. He's doing his best to follow the Lord. And you know what? I think that there's a great fruit of that spirit here. Amen. Follow who you have to follow as they follow the Lord. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse number 5. We'll read that again. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. Right? The manner of men that we were, they're bringing forth as example, and that's for your sake. He's teaching the Thessalonians how to be by the way that they were. And I th I'm pretty sure, yeah, it's in this, pa let's just keep reading because my mind's already going to get ahead of it. Verse number six, and ye became followers of us and of the Lord. By following their example, not only were they followers of them, but also of the Lord. Right. Because they're giving the example of how to follow the Lord. Yeah. Having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. So now, because they followed the Apostle Paul and Barnabas and the, you know, and the disciples that were, that were preaching unto them and teaching them, they were followers of them and of the Lord, and now they're able to be good examples unto others. And that's how that continues to work. Uh, verse number eight, For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith to God word is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. For they themselves show of, show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Flip over to Second Thessalonians chapter number 3. So he's praising them here for, for, their, you know, for their following and being a good example on the others. But we're also going to see how, in, in, the, in the second epistle of Thessalonians, how he's also instructing, him, instructing them to follow his lead and follow his example. Because one of the things that he did there also was taught them how to work hard. And that's something that a man can help do as well to be a follower of how a man works, to give you an example of how you ought to work. Verse number 6 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, the Bible reads, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us. That's a scripture. You know how you ought to follow us. I don't follow any man. Okay, well, that's real biblical. Right, yeah. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. The reason why they were able to follow them is because they weren't doing all these things that were wrong. They had, they had a good example. They weren't disorderly. They kept themselves. Look at verse number eight. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an ensample unto you to follow us. Because Apostle Paul was ministering 
to those in Thessalonica. He, he had every right for them to supply his needs and his wants because he's feeding them spiritually. He's doing a job. He's doing a work for the Lord. He had every right to be taken care of. But you know what? He chose not to. He chose not to. You say, you know what? No, save your money. I'm going to show you guys how to get it done. I'm going to show you how you could work. I'm going to show you how you could preach. I can show you how you could do all of it, how you could serve the Lord and provide for yourself and get everything done. And you know what? It takes a lot of work. It takes labor and travail night and day to get everything done. But I'm going to show you how to do it. That's a great example. And that's something that we could all learn from. And you know what? There's a lot of great people out there doing a lot of great work who are taking a lot of time to stay up late, to get up early, to go to work, to do all kinds of things. Why? For the benefit of others. To further the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know what? Praise God for the good examples out there. Amen. And we should be looking for those good examples. Yeah. And using that and following that. N Notice the difference though. The example, the encouragement from what others are doing. Versus the nitpicking and trying to get involved in, in what other people are doing and just spending too much time focused on other people when you've got a job to do. Yeah. Nobody is going to be perfect. Nobody. So if you're waiting for the perfect person, well, Jesus Christ was already here. Now we have ambassadors in his stead. Okay? And look, follow Christ. Amen. And as I, as I already mentioned, you don't have to, to worry and pick and choose where he's off because he's never off. But also don't forsake the, the leader, the, the example that you can also follow to help you follow Christ. Because God gave ministers to help you. That's why they're there. They're there to help you. For those of you who may have an interest in not just preaching, and many of you preach here, right? There's, there's multiple people here, men that, that come up and preach, yeah. right? This will help you out, and, and hopefully you already have this mindset because you should. When you get up to preach, you should be thinking about what's going to help people in this church. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Good. That's what I've received, and that's what I do. And that's the example I have to follow is, hey, I'm worried about everyone else. What can I preach? What can I teach on? What is going to be beneficial to people here? Now, obviously, everything in the Bible is going to be beneficial, yeah. right? But you want your heart and your mind focused on the people who are going to be hearing your word. That's why, you know what, I'm not a, I'm not a big fan of, like, preaching to the Internet. And anyone who, who's, who's followed anything that we do over a stronghold... I don't concern myself with what everybody else is doing and I don't feel the need to just go and just preach to, to just a whole bunch of random people I don't even know because my job is to preach to the church, to my church, right? Now, I'm obviously here to try to help you all here at this church, but my job and the work that I have to do, I'm going to stay focused on that and I don't want to get distracted with what's going on everywhere else, especially stuff that does nothing to do with, with what we're doing at all. And, and we need to maintain that focus because the job we have to do is so important and the job that we have to do is hard enough as it is to focus on doing that work. Last place, I'll have you turn, look at Hebrews chapter 13. And you see the amount of love that the Apostle Paul had in, you know, I forget if it's First or Second Thessalonians, who said that we we're willing not only to impart the gospel of God to you, but, but our own souls. That, that, they were, that they loved them and cared about them so much. I mean, they're pouring out their souls onto these people because they want them to succeed. They want them to grow. He, they want them to see the good example and they're willing to just sacrifice, be self-sacrificial to help them. And this is what we all need to do. Yes, you do that when you go out and take part of your time and you go out and preach the gospel to the lost. But you know what? There's probably more areas where we can do better at that, where we could do better at helping people grow. How about even just praying for the people? I love that I heard that uh, uh, earlier in the service tonight. 
pray for those that got saved and pray for those that didn't, right? How about just having even that level of care and thought and focus on other people? How can we get them to succeed? How can we get more people taught and trained and discipled? Yes, lead them to Christ, but you know, what more can we do to help the people of this area? What can we do? Absolutely follow the tried and true to everything that, that, that the Bible lays out and the soul and everything else. But let's have that servant minister spirit and attitude to, to do what we can. You know what? Sometimes you might get burned. Someone might stab you in the back. Someone might take advantage of you. Welcome to Christianity. Don't let that discourage you. Yeah, it's sad when it happens. No one likes when it happens. No one likes getting stabbed in the back. It's not fun. But you can't let that let get you out. That doesn't change. When people do bad to you, that doesn't change what's right. Yep. Ever. Good. Never changes what's right. It's just like, I give this advice over and over and over again in my sermons on marriage. Right? The Bible tells us Husbands and wives have, your, have the specific roles laid out. You can read Ephesians chapter 5. But you know what? Don't let the actions or inactions of your spouse determine whether or not you're going to be right with God in your role. Yeah. Right. Wives, if your, your husband's a jerk and he doesn't love you self-sacrificially, the, Bible, the, the Bible, the Bible says he ought to love me. How about you be submissive and obedient the way the Bible says? Because that's what you can do and that's what you can control and you can follow Christ. And not worry about what someone else does. How about, you know, vice versa? Men, well, my wife's not listening to me. She's not being very obedient. She's not doing what she's supposed to be. You know what? You love them self-sacrificially anyways. You love them the way that Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. That's what you're called to do. In whatever other areas you have in life. I mean, that's just one that's really easy to bring up because... You know, for everyone that's married, that's something that probably comes up every day. <laughs> it's something that everyone could, can use to grow and, and to help your marriage, right? To say, look, I'm going to focus on what I can do. Okay, you can't control what other people do. I'm going to serve the Lord to the best of my ability. And if other people don't, that's on them. I'm going to serve the Lord to the best of my ability. And whatever John does and whatever Peter does and whatever, you know, anyone else does, what is that to me? I'm going to follow Christ. Hebrews 13, 7, of course, um, one last point on, on following, having a, a good spiritual leader. Verse 7 says, remember them which have the rule over you. And in church, you know what? There is someone who has a rule over you. There's an authority structure. And it is the bishop of the church. That's, that's who God set up to have the rule over the church. Remember them which have the rule over you. And it, and it even tells you, you know, who have spoken unto you the word of God. The people who are teaching you the word of God, and specifically the pastor, the bishop, who's been set up as the authority, which is why the requirement of being able to rule your own house well, how then can you care for the, the, the church of God? If you can't rule in your house, how are you going to rule in the house of God? You have to have that, that qualification there in order to do that because they are the ruler within the church who have spoken a new word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. And that word conversation is an old word. It, it doesn't necessarily mean the way that you talk with someone. It has more to do with how you present yourself and how you live. Your conversation is, is more who you are, how you act. All of that is, is part of your conversation, the end of their conversation. Follow the faith. Follow the faith of Pastor Shelley. He's taking on a great responsibility. He's got all kinds of things going on, and I think he's doing a really good job. And I could tell from here that he's doing a really good job. You've got a great church. Hopefully, you're blessed with something out of the Bible tonight Amen. or this morning. Unfortunately, I don't, I don't know you all that well, so I, I was kind of praying blindly because I don't know what to preach. I, I hope there was something that can help you to grow and to help you succeed and help you do better in your life, in your spiritual walk, in your service to the Lord. Because I'd love to see this church just, just continue to grow 
and reach more and more people and have that lighthouse just be shining brighter and brighter and brighter in this area. Amen. Praise God for that. Amen. Thanks for having me tonight. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for uh, all the wonderful works that you do for us. Lord, help us to show our gratitude by teaching us and instructing us to w what you'd have us to do. Help us understand your will in all areas of our life. God, I pray that you would please bless this church, bless all the people here. Lord, help us all to, to just grow more and become better Christians and, and follow you and not be distracted with other things, Lord, and, and help us to be able to deal with all the complications of this life, but, but that we can maintain that single focus of just being willing to serve and having a humble attitude and, and ultimately just following you, Lord. We thank you for giving us the word. We thank you for providing us with... Uh, with spiritual leaders. We thank you for providing us, obviously, with your word and all the instruction that you give us, Lord. Thank you for all you do. Please keep us all safe tonight as we go our separate ways after the service, Lord, and um, thank you for the opportunity you've given me to be here tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.